two-year-old Shui Shui is about to undergo a major neurosurgical operation. Shui Shui has been diagnosed with epilepsy. The abnormal development of his brain's left hemisphere results in frequent seizures. Doctors hope to stop his worsening condition through surgery. After positioning and marking, the skull is opened and the brain is exposed. An incredible process has begun. After nine hours, two-thirds of the boy's affected left hemisphere of the brain has been removed. Amazingly, not only will he survive the surgery, but the bodily functions temporarily lost due to the surgery will gradually be restored in the right hemisphere of his brain. Neurosurgery is the most cutting-edge and youngest branch in the field of surgery, and it's also one of the most challenging. Even today, the brain is a world whose mysteries still have not been fully revealed. New video shows chaos at the festival exits. A mass shooting in Las Vegas leaves 59 people dead and over 500 injured. The killer's motive becomes the focus of media attention. We don't have any biological or psychiatric information on him. His name is Stephen Paddock and uh, just a nothing guy and um, just a mysterious person but probably from a family of narcissists. And, um, and so we're trying to figure out why. The page are of significance to Paddock, and we're learning that he may have considered using tracer bullets to increase his deadly action. James Fallon is a neurobiologist who works with the FBI. Over the past 10 years, he studied the brains of thousands of psychotics, including the most cold-blooded of killers, such as Stephen Paddock. What is done is that a subject or patient or here a criminal is is brought in and given injections of very low dose of radioactivity and then they're put into the scanner the PET scanner behind me. After a long-term comparative study Fallon found that many vicious criminals have one thing in common the frontal and temporal lobes of their brain, which are associated with self-control and empathy, function poorly. Fallon speculates that it is the loss of this brain function that causes a lack of moral awareness and empathy and finally results in their criminal behavior. In point of fact, all human behavior, moods, and habits are inseparable from the brain. The brain is the most complex and sophisticated organ of the human body, and it has a very different appearance from other human organs. It's soft and fragile, and it consists of countless fine blood vessels that are interwoven. The brain is the source of consciousness, it contains about 100 billion neurons. That's as many as all the stars in the galaxy. Networks made up of countless neurons direct us to run, eat, and avoid predators. 
But although many exciting discoveries about the brain have been made, scientists admit that we still know very little about it. I perceive the brain as something we still know very little about. We know details of how it works, the physiology and the connection. But the big question of how we get from these neural circuits into the sense of being conscious, we, that is still a mystery. So the most fundamental thing is unknown. And so in a way, my, the, my view of it is we don't know anything yet. The exploration of the brain is not solely a modern practice. In the distant past, people tried to discover its secrets through a very dangerous method. In 1992, researchers at a 5,000-year-old archaeological site found a skull with an unusual hole in its occipital bone. The hole was round, about three centimeters in diameter, and had smooth edges. After examining it with medical imaging equipment, researchers found that a new layer of cortex had formed at the edge of the round hole. This suggests that the skull's owner lived for some time after the hole was made. It may seem incredible that prehistoric human beings could survive with a skull fracture, but this is not the only discovery of this kind that's been made. Archaeologists have found similar skulls with round holes in them in North Africa, Europe and Russia. Modern archaeology has shown that the craniotomy is one of the earliest operations carried out by human beings. With no protective measures available, which doctors would have had to open the skull with a stone tool? disinfect it with carbon powder or hot sand, stop the bleeding with sap, and relieve the pain with liquor or plants that had a calming or anesthetic effect. Despite the high risk, some people survived the surgery as the wound was small. But success depended more on the patient's luck than on the skill of the witch doctor. Surprisingly, this practice still existed at the beginning of the 20th century. At the time, the emergence of X-rays and aseptic, hemostatic and anesthetic techniques gradually made surgery the leading force in medical advancement. While several great advances were made in the field, success for neurosurgeons was rare. Opening a patient's skull continued to be a high-risk affair. Because they're just so small or they're so deep that you cannot see them, and if you cannot see them, you cannot effectively treat them. The mortality of neurosurgery at that time was 80%, uh, and, and why? Uh, it was because of infection, for one reason, 
uh, and because of bleeding, the brain is very vascular, and so entering the brain uh, always led to a lot of bleeding. And the difficulty in localizing the disease that you were interested in. Due to limited knowledge of the brain and the poor technical conditions of the time, progress in neurosurgery was extremely slow. But the emergence of a medical genius would soon change everything. They weren't all patients of Harvey Cushing. Once in a while, I'd come across a photograph of a child trying to smile. You could see that they're, you know, dealing with a brain tumor or something. The photographs have a, a more somber, um, intense look about them. So they're not just portraits. They're portraits of people who are um, experiencing very um, harsh um, medical conditions. Terry DeGrady is the director of the Harvey Cushing Research Center at the Yale University School of Medicine. She's sorting out photo plates, scanning them, and uploading them into a database. There are over 10,000 such photo plates to sort through. There's also a collection of surgical records, as well as 700 glass jars containing tumor and brain specimens. They all belonged to Harvey Cushing, a brilliant medical mind of the early 20th century, known as the father of neurosurgery. As a new surgeon, Harvey Cushing's main challenge was precisely locating brain lesions. Although highly penetrating x-rays were already widely used in medical diagnosis, they could only clearly show bones. The new diagnostic method simply did not work with soft tissues like the brain. The photos, records and specimens in the Harvey Cushing Research Centre bear witness to Cushing's lifelong work. This is a head x-ray taken in 1910. The man in the x-ray was Leonard Wood, an American soldier with meningioma, a common head tumour. But the x-ray gives no clue as to the location of Wood's tumour. Eventually he went to Cushing. He opened the skull. He knew where the tumour was. So how did uh, Cushing know where his tumour was? He knew because Leonard Wood's seizures would begin in his left hand and he would twitch his left hand and Cushing knew then that the tumour irritating his brain was on the right side, on the hand area. Harvey Cushing knew very early on that there was a close connection between the location of a brain tumour and certain parts of the body. He spent a great deal of time examining each patient, recording their physical symptoms, photographing and filing the images, and looking for connections between the symptoms and the tumours. The face is the most expressive, right? The second most expressive is the hand. So the hand tells a lot about the health of the person. Uh, and of course, in the pituitary tumor patients, the hand would also be large. <clears throat> so keeping a record of how the patient looked when, the, when they first came to see him was critical to making the diagnosis. And then he continued to photograph the patient during the course of his care so that he could keep up with any changes in physical appearance until the patient was well, or in fact, until the patient died. Using these studies, Harvey Cushing put forward the methods for the diagnosis, grading, and classification of intracranial tumors. It was these methods that Harvey Cushing used to locate and remove 
Leonard Wood's tumour. Harvey Cushing also solved many basic problems that had plagued this field, reducing the death rate in brain surgery from 90% to 8%. Today, two brain diseases are named after Harvey Cushing. Many benign tumours on the surface of the brain can now be treated thanks to him. However, the conventional diagnostic methods Harvey Cushing came up with are not 100% accurate. To minimize the chances of death, doctors must look directly into the brain before surgery. Thirty-four year old Lai Min Li has come to Beijing from Fujian province with her husband to treat her sudden bursts of cerebral hemorrhaging. There's no need to open her skull to find out what's wrong with Lai's brain. These grey-white images are effective diagnostic tools. The images show that some of Lai Min Li's cerebral vessels are densely interwoven into a deformed clump. It is this clump that makes the blood pressure in part of her brain so high that it breaks through the vessels, resulting in the deadly bursts of hemorrhaging that have nearly killed her. Lai Min Li has been diagnosed and is scheduled to undergo surgery as soon as possible. Today, medical imaging of the brain has become a neurosurgeon's eyes. It can help them see exactly what's happening inside a patient's brain. In Harvey Cushing's time, this was something that doctors could only dream of. <laughs> Accessible to ordinary x rays. To study the brain could involve undesirable procedures. Okay, it's going to be a little pain in your head. This rare footage from decades ago shows the efforts doctors went to to see the brain. The doctor injects a liquid into a patient's brain for an angiograph. To highlight the blood vessels of the brain, the doctor then straps the patient to a chair and rotates it 180 degrees. He then observes the patient's brain to locate the lesion through a combination of multiple X-ray plates. The more angles doctors can take the X-ray from, the more clearly they can see the patient's brain. This was how CT technology was developed nearly 30 years after Harvey Cushing's death. It finally gave doctors the ability to clearly see an image of the human brain. This is one of the fastest and most precise CT machines in the world. It takes just 0.4 seconds for the detectors inside the machine to receive the X-rays penetrating the human body and form 5,000 cross-sections. While one X-ray plate can only show one cross-section, the patient's physiological structure can be precisely and fully displayed if the 5,000 layered X-ray plates are combined and simulated on a computer.
deswegen kann man mit einer normalen Röntgenaufnahme auch nur Knochen erkennen oder Objekte, die einen großen Dichteunterschied zu ihrer Umgebung haben. Objekte, die nur einen geringen Kontrastunterschied haben, wie zum Beispiel Blutungen oder Tumoren, die gehen in einem normalen Röntgenbild verloren. In der Computertomographieaufnahme sieht man alle Strukturen in einer Schicht des Kopfes ohne Überlagerung. Deswegen kann man auch feine Dichteunterschiede wie zum Beispiel zwischen einer Blutung und dem gesunden Gehirngewebe erkennen. Through the efforts of scientists, other examination technologies have also been developed, such as magnetic resonance imaging and positron emission tomography. Thanks to these technologies, medical brain imaging today has gone beyond diagnosis and can now assist doctors in complex operations. The operation to remove Lai Min Lee's blood vessel clump is underway. With the help of CT technology, the doctor uses a catheter to infuse a colloidal embolic agent along Lai's artery. This blocks the main vessel supplying blood to the clump and will eliminate the risk of bleeding during the operation. A virtual brain built using data fusion as well as imaging technology such as CT and MRI enables doctors to observe Lai's brain during the operation. Over two hours later, the huge deformed clump is removed. The time bomb that's been inside Lai Min Li for three years is now gone. CT scan的出现啊，呃，不仅是对这个神经外科，它是应该说对医学界，呃，而且不仅是对临床，包括现在这个脑研究，可以说是个划时代的，是个里程碑的。Surgery has never developed on its own. It has always been closely related to the development of basic sciences. And this is most evident in the development of neurosurgery. It was once widely believed that if doctors could see more, they would be able to do more. But sometimes the results were not as expected. In the late 1940s, a form of surgery known as the lobotomy became popular in the United States. It was believed that this surgery could treat certain mental diseases. The surgery was simple and cruel. The whole process took about 10 minutes and no special operating room was needed. The surgeon inserted an awl resembling an ice pick into the patient's brain through the base of the eye socket. He then moved the awl back and forth to cut off the frontal lobe, thus completing the surgical procedure. For a decade, 40,000 to 50,000 such procedures were performed in the United States. Many people lost their ability to speak move or take care of themselves due to severe brain damage.
patient was lying on the table with his head shaved back as far as the vertex. The first mark is made three centimeters behind the lateral rim. Twenty-five-year-old Liang Hao has recently found himself with plenty of free time to read. Three months ago, he was diagnosed with brain stem glioma. This highly malignant tumor that grows deep in the brain stem left him unable to walk on his own. Liang Hao has come to Beijing Tiantan Hospital in the hope that the world's leading neurosurgeons can help remove the tumor. <laughs> Doctors explained to him the extreme danger involved in the procedure and the high chance of a recurrence. But after carefully weighing up the odds, Liang Hao still wants to go ahead with the operation. Brainstem surgery in the base of the skull is widely regarded as the most difficult in the field of neurosurgery. Located deep in the brain, the brainstem is responsible for important functions such as breathing and heartbeat. Densely distributed deep in the brain are the most important nerve tracts and nuclei in the body. Two major arteries also supply blood to the brain here. The space for surgery is so small that any slight mistake can lead to cardiorespiratory arrest. Today, neurosurgeons are able to go into the deepest part of the brain and directly perform operations here without damaging its vital tissues. This was unthinkable even half a century ago. The famous city of Istanbul stretches over the Eurasian landmass. On the Asian side of the city lies one of Turkey's largest private hospitals, Yediti University Hospital. Mahmut Gazi Yasagil is here every weekday. This 92-year-old man is probably the oldest working neurosurgeon in the world. Because of his age, Yasagil no longer performs surgery himself, but every day he still spends much of his time watching his student carrying out surgeries. Professor Yashargi ile birlikte hemen her gün e, ameliyata e, giriyorum. Yani bir saat, iki saat hiçbir şey söylemiyor. Sonra bir şey söylüyor ve benim orada e, düşündüğümü veya farklı bir şey yapmaya çalıştığımı anlayıp bir şey söylüyor ve orada gerçekten çok kritik noktalarda çok önemli katkılarda bulunuyor ameliyata. Mahmoud Gazi Yasagil was born in Turkey in 1924. 
He studied in Europe and the United States, and during those studies abroad, he made the most important discovery of his life. In the city of Jena in Germany, there's a museum dedicated to optics. In this converted 19th century optical processing workshop, museum staff present a vivid demonstration of how craftsmen used to produce microscope slides. When the microscope was invented 300 years ago, human beings' understanding of the world around them expanded dramatically. It's no exaggeration to say that it was the microscope that made modern medicine what it is today. Eventually, this most significant of achievements in the field of optics was introduced into surgery. And so the first commercial microscope that we made, which is the Opni-1, which was made in 1953, was in conjunction together with an ENT doctor. I mean, that's the goal of a microscope, is it gives the doctor, the surgeon, light magnification and move, maneuverability movement. The newly created surgical microscope soon caught Yasagil's attention. While carrying out anatomical experiments on the brain in the 1960s, Yasagil discovered that with the magnification of a microscope, surgeons could reach any part of the brain through the gaps between its wrinkles. They could thus operate on it with minimal damage. After extensive practice, in 1967, Yasagil performed the world's first microscope-assisted surgery on a cerebral aneurysm deep inside the brain, carrying out an anastomosis on blood vessels as thin as two millimeters in diameter. This marked the birth of microneurosurgery. Today, deadly diseases such as severe cerebral aneurysms and malignant tumors in the brain can be treated with microneurosurgery. Yasagil's efforts gave new hope to thousands of people suffering from brain diseases. Today, microneurosurgery has reached an unimaginably advanced level. This is clearly demonstrated in Liang Hao's extremely difficult brainstem surgery. Injecting a new fluorochrome into the brain enables the tumor tissue intertwined with his brainstem to show a unique yellow-green fluorescence under the microscope. In this way, doctors can use the microscope's fluorescence mode to help identify the location of normal tissues and tumor tissues. 
就这流露出出来了一点。The procedure is over, but because of the highly malignant nature of glioma, the likelihood of recurrence is still very high. Organ肿瘤可能如果单从外科治疗，不是根本性治疗，它可能只是说在整个治疗过程当中起到一个很重要的作用。它哪怕有暂短的两年、三年这种快乐，对人生的一种新的看法，我们也会要尝试和努力。让他能够得到这些。实际上，你看你现在其实恢复的挺好的。手指头，来，来，伸开了我。你还有什么小一点的愿望？ Neurosurgery is a relatively young science, and heartbreaking failure is inevitable in many cases. But patients' pain and the desire to survive have inspired generations of neurosurgeons in their quest for progress. Today, neurosurgeons from all over the world have come to share their latest experience in dealing with lesions deep in the brain, as well as cutting-edge technology in intracranial diagnosis and treatment. Removing diseases within the complex structure of the brain remains a huge challenge for neurosurgeons. Thanks to the efforts of doctors, a brand new field of neurosurgery is being opened up. Our brains are not just made up of fat, blood and water. The brain also contains electricity. The source of this electricity is neurons, which can be found everywhere in our brain. When we're awake, our brains can generate between 10 and 23 watts of electricity, enough to light a bulb. To understand uh, the working of the brain is really beyond our comprehension right now. The brain has uh, such a complicated uh, wiring system and it's even more complicated than electrical circuits because electrical circuits go on and off, but uh, in the brain, each connection can be infinitely variable. So you have millions, billions, actually, of, collect of connections. We know very little about the brain. The whole thing is very mysterious, actually. Uh, but neurosurgery in particular, I think, is coupling with neuroscience so that we can discover more about the brain. The brain sends signals through these circuits, allowing our bodies to function and controlling our behavior. When a disorder occurs and the signals are affected, a variety of nervous system diseases will be triggered and the whole body will be affected. Scientists today have found that incorrect signals in the brain can be altered by means of electrostimulation, creating a new way of thinking about therapy. Wang Chiao is 50 years old and suffers from Parkinson's disease. She broadcasts her show on the internet every night from home. She hopes to help those who have fallen into depression due to the disease. 
In China, there are about two million sufferers of Parkinson's disease. They experience uncontrollable shaking and rigidity due to abnormal electrical discharges deep inside their brains. In severe cases, they may have difficulty swallowing and lose basic abilities such as walking. Having lived with the disease for 14 years, Wang Xiu had been able to live a normal life with the help of certain medications. However, these are no longer effective enough to control her deteriorating condition. So, she's now decided to undergo surgery as soon as possible. The procedure Wang Jiao will undergo is called deep brain stimulation. This micro electrode is just a few microns in diameter. It's the latest tool doctors are using to treat Parkinson's disease. During the procedure, no tissue will be removed from Wang Jiao's brain. Instead, two micro electrodes are implanted through two tiny holes in the skull into the area where the disordered electrical discharge is occurring. The high-frequency electrical stimulation generated by the microelectrodes will alter the discharge pattern of the corresponding nuclei, thus reducing Wang Chiu's tremors. Wang Chiu is given local anesthesia to ensure that the procedure does not affect her speech. Conversations like this will take place from time to time throughout the operation. Electrical signals in different parts of the brain are converted into sounds of different frequencies. This helps the doctor manipulate the microelectrodes and gradually approach the target lesion. After two hours of surgery, Wang Chiu was finally freed from the tremors that have blighted her for 14 years. Even a tiny error during this process could have led to a very different result. Because of doctors' unending exploration, human beings have been given more possibilities for treating brain diseases. You should be very, very, very careful of this it. 你只有越深越细地去了解了它，你才能够去把握它，或者是小心翼翼地不去损害它。One of the main changes in society is that we become older and older, and when our brains become older, we have more and more risk for brain diseases. And the development of Alzheimer's disease and other brain diseases that go up with age is one of the big problems for our children. So if we want to give our children a better future than we have, we should uh, know more about those diseases and try to find uh, um, treatments. The great thing about predicting the history of where science, like brain science, is going is you can. There's always some new technique or some discovery that changes everything. And, and so that's part of the great thing. Every morning, scientists, we wake up and we go, what has happened to the, yesterday? And we always find amazing things and they're completely, I don't think you could predict them. Many of the things you can't predict. And, that, and that's what makes it wonderful because it's a, it's, a, it's a mystery.
The brain is one of the most complex organs in the human body. It determines how we perceive ourselves and the world. With their extraordinary determination, patience and courage, surgeons have explored the brain inside the cranial cavity. They have bravely declared war against pain, helplessness and death resulting from brain diseases. The secrets of the brain have not yet been fully unlocked. As for how far neurosurgery can go, no one knows. This is a challenge with no end in sight. To know the human brain is to know ourselves. And after all, the ultimate goal of medicine is moving forward through constant self-knowledge. The final parts of the human body was conquered by the scalpel, thanks only to a rebellious act against orthodoxy. A highly unconventional approach brought about a breakthrough of epic proportions.